So that's me, and I should a little shout out to my buddy Bill Burnett. So Bill Burnett and I uh, founded this thing called the Life Design Lab at Stanford going on a dozen years ago. Now what's that all about? I mean, what do we need to do that for? Why do we need a life design lab at Stanford University anyway? Well, let's see if we can't figure that out. We're user-centered designers, so let's talk to the user. That would be students. So we talk to students, we ask them a question. What are you gonna do after you graduate? Now listen to these very, very, very smart students give their really insightful answers to that challenging question. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I was gonna go to med school, but some grades changed that. I think I'm gonna go to law school. <laughs> Um, um, ooh, uh, 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 I, <laughs> you listen carefully, my favorite one right there. I have no idea. Okay, now, <clears throat> did we wait all day long for the 12 clueless Stanford students to show up so we can make them look bad? No, this took about five minutes. Um, we could do it on any afternoon, it's not at all difficult. Now, where did we capture these videos? At a career fair. True story, at the career fair, they're all got the clean clothes on, all ready to go talk to the grown-ups about their future lives, and that's what's on their mind. So that means we got a problem, ladies and gentlemen, and that problem means we have a mission. So the mission of the Life Design Lab is to apply the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life at and after university. Now, if you double-click on the colored words there, you'll actually get a white paper that's a very pedagogically correct approach to describing what we do. It's a little complex. The simpler version is simply, hey, we're the guys to teach the courses to help you figure out what you'll want to be when you grow up. Now, by the way, how many of you just can't wait till you get that done? You just can't wait to be all done growing up. Want to be all done growing up? Yeah, because then you get to be dead. That's really cool. You know, um, <laughs> No, we, this actually is even a bad framing where you like to reframe things, by the way. So a reframe is like, ooh, it's all psychological. That's such great news. That's a reframe, you know, what Chalkai just did for you. So the reframe is, no, 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 we'll help you figure, keep figuring out over and over again what you want to become next. That's a better idea. We put it that way, then everybody goes, ooh, can I take the class? And unless you're one of the 16,000 people on our campus, unfortunately, for the last 10 years, we've said no. So that's why we actually wrote the book. The way you wrote the book, you know, and then the book became this, you know, big, bestseller, international bestseller, 23 languages, a third of a million copies across the world, total surprise to us, you know, and then Herb calls up and says, hey, please come to, to Liverpool and talk to TEDx. Why is that? You're all here. I mean, you know, it's Father's, go home and make your dad feel better. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, my goodness, you know. But you're here. Well, now, why is that? Why is that? Well, we think there's a particularly compelling reason, which is what we call, you know, people are stuck. No cows were harmed in the making of the slide, okay, you know, it's an organic, seemed like a good idea at the time, you know, but nonetheless, you know, why? Why where are we and cows stuck? Because of what we call dysfunctional beliefs. Dysfunctional beliefs, ideas that are either just flat out untrue or at least not generative. They're not helpful. They don't get you anywhere. So let me give you a couple of examples. You know, so first of all, I hang out a lot in college these days, you know, um, and very often we talk about what are you studying, right? So what's your major? Oh, I'm majoring in anthropology with a minor in creative writing writing, you all know the next question, which is, what are you going to do with that? You know, <clears throat> and of course the answer to what are you going to do with that is, be unemployed or go to law school. So, you know, <laughs> because poor is not that cool. Now, here's the problem. Why is this a dysfunctional belief? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because, according to the research, within five or ten years after graduation, 80% of college graduates are working outside their field of baccalaureate study. How many of you are doing for a living what you studied when you were 19? Okay, all sick, and they're on the front. How about that? You know, it's like, they're like, I'm still doing it. You know, it's an unusually large group. You can make a small group out of that. You know, it's about 5% of the population at best. Things change. What you study does not determine who you are. By the way, watch out for the questions you ask. All questions have belief systems. The question, what are you going to do with that, believes that what you studied will determine your future. Stanford has 74 undergraduate majors. Most colleges have spent somewhere between 55 and 80. There are 7.2 billion people in the world. They do more than 80 things. You know, come on, do the math. All right, moving on. Now, dysfunctional belief number two, what's your passion? Or the way we properly say it in today's culture is what's your passion? <laughs> what's your passion? Are you doing your, you are doing your, you're, you're passionate, aren't you? Have you not found your passion? You haven't? Oh dear. 
Here's the problem. The research shows that, 80, again, we like 80% apparently, but it's all what the data gives us. 80% of the people when asked the question about passion say their answer is either, I don't know yet, I'm hoping I might find one, or, hey, which one did you want to hear about first? I got a bunch. <laughs> so many of you are in the, I don't know, I got a bunch. Now, those people can't answer the what's your passion question very well as the starting place of the happy life. So the meta-narrative of we're all falling into the number one most popular question lately, believes eight out of 10 people who are perfectly healthy need remediation. Eh, thanks for playing, that's a bad idea. It's called a dysfunctional belief. Don't get stuck there. Most people earn a passion by living into it. Passion as outcome, not usually passion as starting point. My personal favorite, be the best you. Are you being the best you? Are you? Are you, is, is this really it? Is this re, are you sure you're doing the right thing? Because you're not settling. Not settling. Not here. Metro Steve, he's not settling. Are you settling? Poker boy is not settling. Come on. Here's the problem with the best. The best has a word, means something, right? You know, um, it means denotatively that against a series of alternatives, there's one set of appropriate criteria against which we can evaluate them all fairly. We can actually get reasonable information and be able to rank these alternatives where one is in fact superior to all the others, i.e. it is the best one. Or as we often say in business, you know, the good is the enemy of the better and the better is the enemy of the best. Are you being your best? Are you? <laughs> the kind of whole Tony Robbins thing. Are you going for it? Have you left anything on the field? Or are you being your best? The problem with that is, in life, it doesn't work. Look, you know, I mean, Herb may be 50. I'm 65. I have seven grandchildren. Anybody here got more than seven grandchildren? I win. Okay. <laughs> Five adult kids, four are married. I got more to go. I'm not even done. <laughs> I've been busy. So, <laughs> watching them calculator. Anyway, the, anyway, the um, I probably just broke a rule. I'm sorry. The, um, but the thing about best, so I've, on my sixth career, you help me understand what's better. What is better, my author self or my grandfather self or my educational reformer self? Which one's better? You can't compare them. There is no best you. There are lots of good yous. So if you've decided you have to be your one best you and there isn't one best you, there's lots of good yous. And by the way, you'll never get to live all of them at the same time. So you won't even know if it is the better one. You couldn't even know if it was best if there were one. And there isn't anyway. So don't sign up for being unhappy for the rest of your life pursuing something that's not there. There's lots of good use. That means there's really time for the reframe. There's lots of great use. The centerpiece of our exercises, which we haven't got time to do right now, would be what we call the Odyssey planning exercise. In 12 minutes on one piece of paper, you can lay out three completely different versions of the next five years of your life. Because there's more than one of you in there. All of us have more aliveness in us than one lifetime permits us to live. There's more, of one of you in, more than one of you in there. You want to hear from all of them, even though you're going to go only get to live one at a time. So, you know, it's never too late to get started, which means it's time for us to really move forward by designing our lives. This design thing, okay, that's the secret sauce, design thinking. What's that really all about, Dave? What's this design thinking stuff? We teach whole courses on this, you can get a whole degree in this thing. Well, let me give you a couple of ideas about it. First of all, the best way to understand design thinking is what it's not. There are lots of ways to think. There's engineering thinking. I have two engineering degrees, engineers are great. They solve things. They solve what are called tame problems, well-bounded problems to which we have all the data, all the information, all the equations. You wanna build a bridge, you know, you build a bridge and it works just fine. Tame problems stay solved. The bridge doesn't wake up on Thursday going, eh, I'm just over it. <laughs> this whole stress thing, you know, I'm just like, I'm not going there. You know, bridges don't do that, thankfully, you know. Uh, and, uh, and so engineers solve tame problems. It's a great way to think, but it's only one of many. Then we have business people. We've got lots of business people. Now, in business, you are never right. You're never done, but you can get better. You can optimize. Your customer never loves you enough, your profitability is never high enough, you know, your systems are never efficient enough, but you can get better and better and better. You can get a, a PhD, you can get an MBA, you can learn how to quantifiably do optimization, and you get better and better and better. 
That's a way of thinking in the world. We do research. I hang out at the academy now where we get PhDs and do research stuff. That goes all the way back to Plato and Aristotle and a very rigorous mechanism for coming up with the definition of new knowledge, starting with a hypothesis and having dependent variables and independent variables and this, a process of replication. It's a way of creating information. And it works really great, except for a whole class of problems. None of these approaches work very well on messy, human, wicked problems. Problems where you don't even know if you've solved the problem until you're done. And once you've solved it, that solution is not reusable, again, anywhere else. It just keeps moving around on you. Those are intrinsically human problems, and for human problems, especially the ones where the thing you're building is a thing we've never been to before called the future, the future you, the future world, you have to build your way forward. You can't analyze the future. You can't assess the future because it doesn't exist yet. You have to build it. It's a hands-on empirical process. Now, a lot of ways to describe it, but one of the ways we like is to think about mindsets. What's the mindset of a designer? And designers think in a variety of ways. They start, first of all, with curiosity. That's really the, where the engine of this thing drives. From that, we go out, ask a lot of questions, radically collaborating with every kind of person, not necessarily radical ideas, but radical inclusiveness. That's going to give us some reframing points of view. We want to make sure we understand what we're doing, keeping our process well in mind. And when in doubt, do stuff, don't talk about it. So I'll keep <coughs> moving on. Now, designing a life, what is it really? We teach this long Stanford course, it's a 240 page book, you know. Well, it's, it's all that stuff. You know, we haven't really got time. Gee, Dave, isn't there a simpler version? Well, sure. If I've got to give it to you like in one sentence or one slide, it's really four things. Get curious, talk to people, try stuff, and tell your story. Let me click into each one of those. Get curious. What do I mean by get curious? By get curious, we simply mean <clears throat> you want to curate your curiosity. Curiosity is really your best friend. The best way to do that is by pursuing latent wonderfulness. Latent wonderfulness means you're going to presuppose that there's something interesting going on over there. Like, oh, I, I bet Liverpool is astonishingly boring. You know, you're going to go, eh, I was right. Um, you know, so you can prove yourself right that way all the time. Well, round up instead, which means I'll give an example with my friend Eric. That's not Eric, and his name wasn't Eric, but there's a guy. Um, <clears throat> And I was teaching a PhD class and talking about pursuing latent wonderfulness, and, and Eric says, look, Dave, I know there's stuff I don't need to go try or be curious about because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I'm bored to tears, I don't like it, don't waste my time. I said, what do you mean, Eric? He says, well, for instance, like the CIA, you know, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States. I know for a fact they're totally uninteresting to me. I said, very interesting as it turns out, Eric, the CIA is on campus next week. You are now assigned to go, or I will funk you. You know, he goes, no, you can't do that. He goes, watch me. <laughs> so next week, class comes up, you know, Eric walks in, he's like, like this, you know. And I go, uh oh, we got a trouble. I go, so class gets going. So, Eric, did you go? And he goes, yes. And I go, this is going to come out badly. <laughs> you know, well, how'd it go? He goes, I'm really upset. <laughs> Why? What happened? It was so interesting. I don't know what to do now. I have a moral dilemma. They kill people. <laughs> but it was really interesting. <laughs> you got to give it a Now, he didn't end up staying there, but nonetheless, you got to give it a chance. So moving on, after you get curious, you want to talk to people. Go out there, you got to go out and talk to people, you know, and get their story. Now, I don't mean a transactional conversation. I don't mean get the money. I don't mean closing a deal. I don't mean trying to look for a job. I mean, just get the story, which, of course, brings up the question of parliament. Um, so years ago, my wife and I were in London and, and had a little extra time, and we happened to be you know, down near the river, near Parliament, and said, gosh, we've never actually been inside Westminster Abbey. Let's go try to do that. So we ran over <clears throat> uh, about 10 minutes before 5, and they were up until 5, you know, and, the, and, and the door was locked. So bang on the door, you know, and, and the door uh, creeps out, you know, and, and, and a, you know, a, a, a properly priestly dressed person sticks his hand and goes, we're closed. And I go, hey, God does not close early. Come on. I mean, you know. Um, and, and he goes, well, we're, we're closed. <laughs> you know, thank you. Um, so the welcoming church. And nonetheless, so he said, but you, go to the, you can go to the garden. So I said, fine. So we wander around the garden, and nobody's there. So a little group of people over here on the side, and we kind of wander around and kind of look at what they're doing. They seem to be having a good time. And this woman beckons us over. And we go over, and, we, and they give us some of their leftover wine and their cheese, you know, at the end of the party. And it turns out, and we say, well, what's going on here? And we talk to this woman named Anne. And Anne turns out to be the chief parliamentarian of Westminster Abbey in Parliament. And she's an American. And I go, really? How did, what does it mean to be a parliamentarian? How did you get to do Tell me the story. So I was really going along, and she kept stopping me, going, do you really want to know this? I go, yeah, I'm really interested. And she told me her whole story. And I had this fascinating conversation because you have to understand, interested is interesting. 
and is used to hosting things but not being the person of interest. And she stayed interesting because years later, a friend of mine, Carol, who lives in Costa Rica, got really curious about parliamentarianism, and I put her back in touch with Anne, and the conversation continued. So talk to people. Curiosity really works. If you're really curious, that's interesting. Now, then try stuff. I mean, you go out and do stuff. So Carol, my friend who lives in Costa Rica, suddenly kind of out of nowhere decides she thinks being a parliamentarian, even though she has no idea what it means until she talks to Anne, you know, might be interesting. And then she's trying to say, you know, how do I do that try stuff prototyping thing of set the bar low and clear it? The way I do that is maybe I sit in on one of those dinners my husband, who does expat training for people in Costa Rica, hosts. So she goes to one of those dinners and just sits in to hear the talk. And her husband says, this has nothing to do with parliament. Why are you going here? And she said, look, trying stuff is doing stuff. I'm trying to do anything I can to have an experience that's going down the path. I'm just trying to learn. I don't need to close the deal. But these are expats. This is a cross-cultural thing. I want to sit in. Now, once you do these kind of experiences, then you tell your story. Because a curated curiosity plus some reflection equals a story. Carol was thinking about these conversations she'd been having. So during the break at that dinner, one of the men said, why are you here? Well, I'm really interested in parliamentarianism, so I came to this dinner. Hey, help me connect the dots between this dinner and parliamentarianism. And she'd thought about it, so she could say a very interesting thing about cross-cultural experience and mediating people's experience of being fully human in more than one context. She goes, I don't know what you're talking about, but I gotta tell you, this woman named Kathy, who works for this company, has really helped me. You have to talk with her. She meets with Kathy. Kathy says, the hard part is getting them housing that will work for them culturally. So what you really need to learn how to do is real estate. Three years later, she's a very successful real estate agent and realizing that's what parliamentarianism really means for her. So, interesting is interesting because she got interesting to tell her story in a way that engaged people with her engagement. And that gets the virtuous cycle working for you. It simply means talk to people, get curious, talk to people, try stuff. You keep that going, you're getting legs under your curiosity. And frankly, you just repeat that until you're engaged like Carol did. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is designing your life. But wait, there's more. <clears throat> gotcha. Okay, so not because we're selling anything, but just, yeah, there's a book, you know, 240 pages. If you want to go to the website, a bunch of free stuff you can download if you, to answer all the questions we can't take, you know. And can you finally take the class? Yeah, online. Go to Creative Blog, you actually take the class. But again, it's time to wrap up. What we're really saying is, why does it work? Because it's based on human-centered design. It's a process built in what the human person is all about, and that's what we're trying to do. So designing a life is trying to be a little more human, and in so being, a little more helpful and a little more hopeful. Which means, as TED goers pursuing the edge of ideation, you want to be more passionate, balanced, K-loving, digital, just downright, innovatively dazzling, at least can we be a little more human? That might be okay. Thanks for your time.